Good evening. This is Tyrone Gathers Jr., your host of The Sources Inc. We're live on KUAW Radio, Knowledge, Understanding, and Wisdom. Please do not adjust your screen or your dial on your radio. This is me. I'm live. We're back. It's been a while. I uh, missed you all due to the pandemic and due to moving. I was kind of out for a little while, but now I'm back, and it feels good to be back in the inkwell. I do want to say, here, Echo. Oh, oh, sorry about that. So, yeah, so we're back in. I had to get things technically together, but um, it feels good to be back in. And uh, one thing I do want to say is that KUAW is a fast global community radio station. We're growing. We're still moving. We're making moves. If you like this broadcast and other shows like it, you can check us out on a number of ways. You can hit us up on KUAW.org. You can go to TuneIn, type in KUAW Radio. You can go to uh, Twitch, Twitter. You can go to Facebook Facebook Live. You can go to YouTube. And you can just type in KUAW Radio and we'll pop right up. Now, on Facebook Live and Twitter... And I believe Twitch and YouTube, you'll be able to see this broadcast. All the other mods, you can actually listen in. So please check us out. Support us. We have lots and lots and lots of lovely shows that can really appease and, and, and touch any intellectual palette that you see. Also, I do want to say if you want to call in, you can hit us up at 816-599-6893. I'll be able to communicate with you live. And if you want to you know, send in a chat or whatnot, like I said, on the YouTube, the Facebook, the Twitter, uh, the Twitch, you'll be able to actually chat live with me as well, too. Like I said, it's been a while since I've been out, but we're back in, and we're going to keep things moving with what I like to do best, education. been teaching for almost 20 years, and I love opening up shows with educational tidbits and information. Now, ladies and gents, started coming back in session, kids wearing masks, the protocols and whatnot. Now we have schools in full time. And there's very, very few kids who are doing the whole virtual piece. Now, with schools getting back in session during a pandemic, one thing that p- teachers and parents and students need to realize is that things are different. And with things being different in the classroom, things are also being different outside of the classroom, too. Now, a lot of teachers are noticing that, hey, look, you know, we have full capacity in our classrooms. And while we have full capacity in our classrooms, the capacity of diversity in our classroom has not changed. It's still a need. So we still have the need for diversity in our classrooms. Keep in mind, you had students who were virtual for a while. Now you have kids who are back in. Now, one thing I do like about schools is there are certain things that kids learn in schools that they don't learn at home. Case in point, being around diverse cultures. You have some classroom, or some students who are around all one race or all one religion or all one gender for a good bulk of their time. So could you imagine a kid being at home um, for this you know, for, you know, six months, possibly, you know, even a year because 29, well, yeah, yeah, possibly about a year um, not being back in school. So you got 2020, 2021, we had certain kids who, excuse me, who were shut in situations that weren't too diverse. Now they're back in classrooms that are more diverse. Same go for teachers, too. So what I want to discuss is how a teacher can model their classroom in a more diverse way. I'm going to give examples. I'm going to give scenarios to help us out. Because teachers sometimes come in with things that may be conscious or even unconscious that may make a student feel as if they're not wanted. Now, the best, the best example of diversity that I can give is a family photo. I want you to think about a family photo, and you have all your uncles and aunts and cousins, mama sitting over there, daddy over there, sister, brother, children, uncles, aunties, a a nice collection of your family. That's a good picture of diversity. However, someone that is feeling as if they're not being included with diversity is that relative that's not in the photo. And that relative that's not in the photo does not feel a part of. 
And that's how kids are in the classroom. If that child does not feel a part of in that classroom, then they in, tu- in turn do not feel a part of the photo. They're not, they're not down with the, the, the classroom. They don't feel connected. They don't feel a part of, and that's a problem. Because as teachers, every student needs to feel as if they're being represented. Um, brother who's a strong supporter of this show and also uh, leader of the block, Cornell Ellis always says representation matters. Students need to feel represented. And also, we all say that it takes a village to, to raise a child. Um, Lene Gray, who is on After Me, she said, and if that child is not embraced by the village, the child will burn the village down for warmth. And that was probably one of the most powerful things that I've heard in regards to representation of children. So teachers, we got to understand what a diverse classroom is. Question is, what is a diverse classroom? I kind of gave you a scenario, but I want to give you an actual uh, definition of what a diverse classroom is. Um, Diversity is everything that makes people different. So I'm different than you. You're different than me. We're different from we. I mean, we may have the same blood flowing through our veins, relatives, but we're different. We may have the same, um, you know, thoughts and beliefs in church, but we're different. It's the differences that make us up. So this includes many different factors, you know, race, um, ethnic backgrounds, genders, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, uh, ability, age, religious belief, or political conviction. And, of course, within the last, what, almost eight years, political conviction has been huge in this country and also in the classroom, too. Matter of fact, you're starting to see more and more students who, are, who have more stronger political convictions than adults. I saw a kid wearing a, a hat of a candidate who they think is going to run and win in 20, what year is this? 2024. So they're already foreseeing their person winning. So we're saying that all of these factors work together to inform how students and teachers and everyone else encounter the world. So diversity, in a nutshell, is our differences on how we encounter the world. Now, also with diversity, we must understand everyone's uh, strengths, everyone's experiences, everyone's needs and ideas and everything that we all bring to the table. So keep in mind, think about it as a potluck. You got a potluck and everyone's bringing a dish. All the dishes may be different, but guess what? We're all eating. Now, for an illustrated definition of diversity, I just kind of gave you that with the whole potluck piece. We're all eating, and we're all enjoying each other's fellowship. Now, if we ignore diversity in our classrooms, and we choose not to promote diversity, you're not doing your job, teacher, because we need to teach a child holistically. Now, the individual sitting in that seat is not just someone getting an English lesson, or a reading lesson, or math, or social studies, or facts, or what not. That kid has a lot of different dimensions to them. That kid is not a one-dimensional piece. That kid is a dodecahedron, if not more. It's multiple sides to that child. So we got to make sure that every side of that child feels comfortable within our classroom setting. Children, children come to school prepared for the, to, to, I'm sorry, to, to be prepared for the workforce. <clears throat> so we're preparing our children to be productive citizens in our country in society. So teachers have a very, very important job. So teaching must effectively address and embrace the realities that come with living and working in a diverse setting. And what better setting is a school. Like I tell my students, when you're in school, you learn how to be effective in your community and in your country. Now, not only that, there are a lot of research-backed reasons to promote diversity in the classroom. Now, I'm going to go through a list of things and items that promote diversity within the classroom. And teachers, if you're listening, parents, if you're listening, students, if you're listening, take a checklist down and write down these notes and kind of gauge the classroom in which you teach, which you are a student of, or parents your kids are in. So, first things first, diversity in the classroom builds critical thinkers. Diversity in the classroom builds critical thinkers. According to an article from the Scientific American, 
We're not likely to think harder about an issue when we're talking to someone who, I'm sorry, we're more likely, my apologies, we're more likely to think harder about an issue when we're talking to someone who is different than us. I have a couple of coworkers that I'm extremely close to, and you all know who you are. Um, I don't need to name you because you know that you're in my circle. And each individual that I'm close to, we have differences, some minute, some extreme. And we learn from each other daily through conversation. Matter of fact, one of my coworkers told me that I challenged him to think daily. And on the same thing, too. I mean, they, ch- they challenged me also. As a matter of fact, I love the differences. You know, I think about that team, the Avengers. You got a Hulk. You got a Black Panther. You got a Hawk, uh, Hawk man, uh, a Hawkeye. You have a Black Widow. You have a Wasp. You have a Captain Marvel, you have a Captain America, you got an Iron Man, you got all these different individuals. They got different power sets and different abilities. However, they all come together and fight the same fight, saving the world. Teachers, we're the same way. Our job is to come together, no matter what our differences are, to fight and save our children from ignorance and to prepare them to be better than us. Decades of research by organizational scientists and psychologists and psychiatrists and sociologists and economics and demographers show that socially diverse groups, you know, that's those who are diverse with race and uh, ethnicity and gender and sexual orientation are more innovative than homogeneous groups. Someone else close to me said, hey, you know, everything's not homogeneous. So we should not have to always think that everything's the same thing. There's not a one size fit all for, for kids. It's different. You know, Lottie Lawrence, may she rest in peace, Miss Lottie Lawrence, she gave me my first job teaching. And she told me that kids are like cars. They all get to the finish line differently. Now, a teacher got to make sure that each car gets to the finish line and the pace and time in which they need to get there. So we got to drive them different. We got to put certain gas in certain ones. We got to tune up each, each car differently. We can't expect each car to get there as soon as you say go to the finish line. So the same article that I talked about earlier from Scientific American also points out that even though the appearance of diversity, no, the key word, the appearance of diversity, makes us change how we approach issues. Now, Now, so basically what I'm saying is you can actually be diverse, Or you can actually appear to be diverse. Either way it goes, if you're dabbling and and, and playing around with diversity, change will occur. Progression will occur. Um, The approaches will occur. So, students, you are no exception to the rule. Diversity in the classroom helps students. It helps students no matter what. It helps students develop social awareness. Social awareness helps us to appreciate different perspectives and draw stronger conclusions. So if you're set with seeing things straight, being in a diverse classroom will help you to see things to the left, to the right, up, down, all around. It helps you look at things from different perspectives because there's more perspectives out there than the ones you have and the ones your mom and dad gave you. I told a student one time, I said, I always love you, mom and dad. However, everything mom and dad teach you isn't always correct, and it's not always positive. So you got to develop your own way of thinking. And being around different people helps you to challenge the way you think. Now, challenging students to consider different perspectives can also teach them how to interact with their peers on a social level and equip them with skills they use for the rest of their lives. Now, I teach middle school. Middle school is a very, very important year. They always said if you don't have those skills by your middle school years, you may not have them in your adult years. So, you, so what better skill to give kids is to be socially aware. Think about that. You have children of different religions still working together in harmony. You know, not to get religious or spiritual or whatnot. Well, not to get religious, but to get spiritual. Let me clarify that. You, we sometimes are told that you only got to be with individuals who are from where you are, who live where you are, and who's going where you are. But that's not a spiritual way of thinking because to go ahead and quote Killmonger off of Black Panther, he said, isn't all people your people? 
So he's correct. All people are your people. So being in one little pocket is not going to help you grow. You got to get outside and connect with more and more individuals because the more people you connect with, the stronger and stronger you get. All right. Number two, being in a diverse classroom also improves academic outcomes. Being in a diverse classroom improves academic outcomes. Diversity in the classroom doesn't improve, just improve social skills. It can also have an impact on academic results. It improves critical thinking skills and encourages academic confidence. Now, I had students in my classroom, and they told me that, Mr. Gathers, you are the first black teacher I ever had. And they're in the seventh grade, eighth grade. That's sad. Or, oh, man, I'm so thankful I have a black male teacher. He's a white student saying this. So the fact that I have students who I'm their first black teacher and first black male teacher, and some kids their first male teacher, it's a strong impact because already they're intrigued and that connection is made. You're the first you that I've ever had. I'm using that to my advantage. So I make sure that I am the best teacher that they ever had, not just the best black teacher, the best male teacher, or the best black, you know, or, or the best black teacher, period. I want to be the best teacher ever that these kids had. And I'm using my differences to open up doors for that connection. Now, according to a case study from the Century Foundation, students who attend a magnet school, that, um, I'm sorry, there was a particular magnet school that these kids were um, attending in a particular state, city and state. They were required to meet racial integration standards through a lottery system. This lottery system outperformed students at suburban schools that had a higher percentage of affluent white students on standardized test scores. Now, I can attest to that myself, too, because <clears throat> my students, I've had extreme gains with my students when it came to reading. We're growing multiple months in one month's time based on us being in a diverse classroom and having diverse ways of thinking. Because when you only think one way, no. It's like one way is not the way. There are multiple ways to assess a problem. Um, it found that integrated schools had less misbehavior, lower dropout levels, and they noticed the students were more likely to want to pursue post-secondary education. Now, Keep in mind, college is not, post-secondary education is not the only way for kids. Now, let's think diversely about this. You have military, you have trade schools, you have the workforce, you have entrepreneurship. You have multiple ways the students can be successful outside of college. No, I'm not dissing college. I'm just saying that college is not the only avenue for students to go down. Being in a diverse classroom and having a diverse way of thinking and a diverse curriculum will show students that there are multiple ways to be successful besides going to college. Now, um, both of my parents are college educated. However, they didn't start out that way. They, they, they finished up like that, but they didn't start out that way. I have friends who are not college educated who went to the military, and they start, you know, they did great for themselves. You have to make the best choice for yourself. Now, a good thing about being in a diverse setting, a diverse classroom, is students are able to think for themselves and find out what's best for them and not what someone is telling them to do. Make sure I'm doing good on time here. Also, number three, being in a diverse classroom also helps students to feel represented and included. Earlier, we talked about the whole photo uh, parable. Kids need to see themselves in your classroom. One thing that I used to remember when I was in school, I used to love having my work on the wall. So whenever my parents would come up, hey, mom, dad, that's me right there. That's my assignment right there. That's me. That's me. That shows that I am being represented and my work is a strong piece in that classroom. According to an OISE professor, uh, Ms. Ann Lopez, diversity can disrupt narratives and stereotypes in the classroom that position diverse people as lacking invaluable knowledge or unqualified. Now, I feel that I am not valued where I am. Um, and I, you know, 
as far as being a black male teacher, we are not valued as a whole as we should be. That's across the board. However, what I do in my classroom, I want my students not to feel the fire that I'm feeling that's burning me. I want my students to feel that they are valued, that their knowledge is wanted, and that they are very qualified to be in my classroom and to exceed my classroom. I tell my students that I'm not the stop. I'm the go. I want you to continue your education outside of me. A good friend of mine said he was so happy that, my, that his daughter was in my classroom. I told him um, two weeks later, I said, I'm your friend. And I'm also going to be a good uh, te uh, teacher to your daughter. Your daughter does not need to be in my classroom. She is advanced. Your daughter needs to be in the advanced classroom. He said, are you sure? I said, I'm strongly sure. So what did I do? I sat him down, and I talked to him about the process on getting his daughter out of my classroom and into the, in, into the advanced classroom. And sure enough, he hit me back up and said, man, thank you. That was the best decision that you could have made for us. And I said, yeah. And, and, what's, and the child right now, she is definitely benefiting from being in an advanced setting. So, and I'm like, there was another student of mine, too. Her, um, this student came to my classroom, and I told her, I said, look, um, you need to be in an advanced class. And I got her in there. So, I let my students see that although you have more students of color in SPED classes and behavioral programs, and you have more white students or students who, uh, who align with white culture in, in rich classes, we break that. I try to get as many kids as possible, whether they're black, white, uh, rich, poor, doesn't matter. Because I feel that you can't tell me that the majority of kids who are, in, uh, who are enriched align with white culture and the majority of the kids who are sped align with multicultural, predominantly black male. doesn't work like that. So in my classroom, I make sure that my students are valued and they feel that they are extremely qualified with the knowledge they possess. Now, there is a California classroom that teaches their um, students their home languages. That is an example of representation. Hey, how, like, how would you speak this in your language? Like me, I don't tell my students who are, um, who are Spanish speaking or, or whatnot not to speak their natural language. No, no, speak your natural language, teach us. How would you say this in your language? How would this sound in your language? Teach the other person your language so you can communicate. Open those doors. Build those connections. We have a uh, cultural competency team. Myself and another teacher that I'm close to in the building, we, since, since we first started working together, I would say three years ago, four years ago. Wow. Yeah, it's been about four years. Well, it, this is the fourth year that we've been working together. We make sure that we represent everyone. So, for example, this month is uh, Indigenous People Month. So we have a scavenger hunt. We have someone possibly coming and speak to our students, doing uh, uh, talking about Native, Native cultures here in, in, in this country. Last month was Hispanic Heritage Month. We had our <clears throat> students do a scavenger hunt through the building where they actually learned about different uh, Spanish-speaking countries. Um, also, we're going to do something for, uh, of course, Black History Month, Women's History Month. Asian History Month. If it's a month, if it's you, we're going to celebrate you. That's what we do. We also have questions. We have competitions. We do a lot. And not only do we build upon uh, racial cultures, we also build upon community cultures too. For example, during parent-teacher conferences, we gave kids a break. We gave parents a break. We had a hopscotch ring in the middle of the hallway, and we had a hopscotch tournament, which I won. <laughs> With a bad leg and all, so my counterparts watching this, I'm letting you know that the champ is here. Uh, we also do, uh, um, and shout out to uh, Sherry Hall, uh, Sherry Purpose Hall. She is um, someone who I have deep love for in regards to the arts, especially with poetry. She, she does so much, her and Terrence Williams with the Music and More Foundation. Uh, we um, have Poetry on the Vine every Thursday at the Corner Bar and Grill. And I know my students can't go there on the evenings of Thursday night because they have school and also, you know, it's, it's kind of hard for them to go hang out down there with adults so what i do i do an extension of poetry in the vine poets edu in my classroom so we have open mic nights we do slams we do cyphers we do a whole lot of that in the classroom out in our courtyard and we're also doing an actual poetry slam in our library from hours one through seven so like a seven hour poetry slam 
each hour we're gonna do you know we're gonna slam and the winner will get a cash prize so um, I'm doing that based off of the uh, the model and the mentorship that Miss Sherry Purpose Hall and Mr. T.L. Williams has put in place because when the kids do the poetry they're able to open up about themselves more and be more diverse the whole poetry piece was extremely um, diverse a diverse way of uh, learning because you had different kids, different classrooms coming together doing poetry. And this uh, upcoming Monday, I'm going to try to get, matter of fact, I might stream some of it on KUAW Radio on their Facebook Live page and YouTube page uh, in regards to show you what it's all about because it's a beautiful thing. We, you had kids up there, just, I mean, just really opening up and just like coming coming hard with it. So um, hopefully I can, if my friends are listening who are poets, you know, please shoot me a, a message. I'm on Messenger still. I may not be on Facebook right now, but hit me up on Messenger or call 816-599-6893. That's K-U-A-W. Or hit me up at The Gethers Group, T-H, I'm sorry, The, and then G-E-T-H-E-R-S group at gmail.com to, uh, you know, let me know if you want to assist sometime next Monday. I would love to have you. But um, diversity needs to be a priority. And when diversity is not a priority, Students don't feel included. So <clears throat> do things to include kids because not every kid's an athlete. Not every kid is a bookworm. You have some kids that are musicians who are writers, who are poets, who are creative. So have things that connect to every kid. Do an interest survey in your classroom, teachers, and see if you can input everything that the kids are interested in in your classroom. I want to give a shout-out to Miss Elise Brummett. <clears throat> she is a, a young teacher. It's her second year teaching. And... I went in her classroom today and I found something that was like one of the coolest things. She is a huge comic book fan and in her classroom library, she has comic books for kids. And what better way to get a kid to read than giving them a comic book? And I thought that was dope for her to have that in her classroom. So I learned something from a second year teacher that, hey, look, I need to get more comic books in my classroom, a graphic novel, because kids love that. Kids read off of that. Kids yearn for that. Also, it makes them feel included intellectually, too, because not every kid reads nonfiction. I was one of those kids that loved comic books. A study from the University of California um, in Los Angeles, UCLA, looked at a diverse classroom to assess the emotional gains of students and found encouraging results. According to that particular study, students in the most diverse classrooms were more likely to feel safer, less lonely, and less bullied in, in school. Now, think about that. Even Superman needed a Justice League. So, yeah, he can save the world, but it would be a whole lot easier having a Batman, a Hawkman, a Green Lantern, a Flash, a Black Lightning, um, a Cyborg, you know, all those superheroes behind you to assist you. A John Constantine, a Wonder Woman, you know, all those amazing heroes, Vixen. All those amazing heroes helped you will help Superman save the day a whole lot better, a whole lot quicker, and a whole lot easier. So having a um, a team behind a student will make them feel as if I can conquer anything. Got to write down these notes because I'm saying some good stuff. Now to understand an idea. To understand an idea is to understand the ideas that surround it, including those that stand in contrast to it. Now, what I'm saying is the idea of diversity creates a rich environment for ideas to evolve into new and more refined forms. The pedagogical approach may be a help to students to appreciate and value all forms of diversity and how diversity enriches learning. So, yeah. You and I disagree, but that disagreement can make us have a very rich environment to where it's safe to disagree with one another because it builds a stronger foundation of trust and unity. Now, let's see. Hmm. So diversity is important to cultivate in our classroom because an academic and social benefit to being diverse helps a student grow into that citizen, into that person, that society, that can benefit society a whole lot better than someone that's not. Now, it's great to know, but 
what does diversity in the classroom look like in action? And how can we promote all of that in school? Now, the good news is there are different ways. Now, one is it will help us reevaluate teaching materials. Ooh, I'm going to say it again. Reevaluating teaching materials. Now, come on now, let's be real. What, what, what's really being taught? What voices are really speaking to our kids in the classroom? Now, I want to shout out the following individuals. I want to shout out uh, Miss Jennifer DeLeo, Mr. Jason Green, Mr. Tom Darrington, and Mr. David Johnson. I've worked with these, and, oh, and of course, Mr. Donnell Fletcher, who, who is now teaching sped English, but he taught history too. <clears throat> these are the um, social studies teachers that I teach with at Raytown Middle School. And these teachers, they teach students the history that they need to learn. They don't, they don't teach that by the book stuff. They come at them real. And those kids say, yeah, I learned so much in that classroom. And it also connects with what I teach in my classroom, too, with English. And we're saying that those history teachers, they bring it in. They, they, they bring the pain. I mean, they, they, they bring the knowledge. And also on the other side of the coin, too, I want to shout out, um, of course, Miss Elise Brummett, <clears throat> Miss Jennifer Ernst, who I, uh, I work with also in Raytown Middle School, too. Those teachers as well, they have a very strong, culturally competent classroom setting. And kids love going to those classrooms. They love it. They can't get enough of it. And then, of course, um, in the math department in um, our building, I'm, you know, and, I, and I'm not, you know, uh, slighting anyone. I'm just going off what the kids are telling me. You got, you know, Miss Magania downstairs, Miss Sarah Magania down there. She's she's bringing it too. So. I want to really shout out those teachers because I can say that I, I have teachers who have a content knowledge about them that's very culturally competent, and kids feel a part of their classrooms. So um, the question is, whose story do you tell? And the individuals that I spoke upon, they tell the stories of the kids who are represented in the classroom and who they are connected to. Now, Especially in humanities and social scientists, sciences, teaching materials can often be limited to Western white male middle class narratives. That's not everyone in your classroom. Everyone in your classroom is not a white male middle class person or, depending on where you go, upper middle class to rich narrative. That's not us. That's not our classroom. We need to work with teachers to see if we're representing a wide range of voices in the curriculum. Take the curriculum and break it down. Is your curriculum only one narrative? Is it talking about oppressing another group? Is it leaving somebody out? Look at your curriculum. If possible, teach literature from authors of color. Because last time I checked, people of color, they write too. Examine historical narratives to see which voices are missing. For example, have a discussion of the civil rights movement and examine how it intersects with gender equality, immigration, and stories of Latino, Hispanic, and, Na and Native American peoples. Because it wasn't just black and white. It wasn't just uh, uh, straight and, uh, and um, LGBTQ+. I mean, civil right now, the civil rights movement, it did touch all those areas. If you really do your research, you will see that it touched all those areas. That's why I like that TV show uh, uh, Lovecraft Country. Because they taught, oh, you saw issues with black and white, male and female, rich and poor, um, straight and LGBTQ. You saw all of that, all represented in the civil rights movement. Now, this is exactly what the Citizens of the World Charter Schools in California, and we have some here too, is doing through a focus on project-based and culturally responsive and data-driven learning. I love project-based learning. I love it because everyone can't sit and take a test. Project-based learning, in my opinion, is the way to go. Culturally responsive education is the way to go. It gives you better data-driven instruction. Now, some projects that you can work on to promote diversity in the classroom include a first grade rally, 
uh, or a rally, excuse me, to end homelessness. You know, students will learn more about homelessness, civic engagement. Students can write letters to the mayor and use their creative skills to produce awareness materials like posters, posters and songs and literature. Now, just recently, the city of Kansas City had an issue with how to house homelessness. Could you imagine if the kids worked with the mayor, Quentin Lucas, to get that uh, taken care of? How about this one? Second language practice, a, a second language practice. Students who speak Spanish at home can help teach their classmates and teachers how to pronounce and translate Spanish words that we come across. For example, you have a house on Mango Street, or we just had Hispanic Heritage Month. Okay, how can we pronounce these words differently, uh, uh, appropriately? I asked kids today, how can I pronounce this word more appropriately? And I had the kids show me. We also talked about food. Uh, we're, we're reading a book called Chew on This, and we're talking about fast food. We had a discussion on how Taco Bell and Chipotle are not considered Mexican restaurants. And I let my Mexican students lead that discussion. I had a young lady from Honduras. She said, although she's not from Mexico, her country shares cultural pieces with Mexico and in support of Mexico. Hey, look, let's talk about cuisine, and that's not our, you know, their cuisine. Um, let's see. Just learning about history in general. While learning about the gold rush, students wrote diaries from a, from a wide range of historical actors like miners and um, mine workers, uh, owners, <clears throat> perspective of women and immigrants, and all that kind of stuff. So talk about an area in history, but then say, you know what? Okay, we're going to talk about the, uh, the gold rush, but how do you think the gold rush would be taught from the um, perspective of a Chinese immigrant or an individual who just got free from slavery or um, a veteran from a, a recent war or from a little girl who is in charge of her uh, family while mom and dad is sick from uh, traveling from the east to the west. You know, think about that. All those things are what kids go through because, you know, they say it's nothing new under the sun. So if there's nothing new under the sun, everything we're going through now, it was going on back then. So let's 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 make that connection. If it's difficult to change your existing curriculum, use the opportunity to ask students why different perspectives aren't included and challenge them up to apply critical thinking skills. I'm gonna take it a step further. Have your students tell their parents to go to a school board meeting, call the principals. Call the curriculum heads and say, look, this needs to be in the curriculum for our students. So challenge your district officials. Because parents, guess what? If you want to, you can go to a school board meeting and get in real good and cozy. And you can apply, apply for election and you can become a school board member, if not the school board president. You can do that. I mean, better, I mean, school board members should be people who actually have kids in the school currently, not people who don't have kids in the school currently. <laughs> Think about that. How are you going to sit up here and enforce a curriculum to students if your kid's not being affected by that curriculum? Ooh, yeah. Also, teachers, get to know your students. Remember earlier I said get that um, particular, <clears throat> what did I say? I said get that, uh, that survey for your students, the interest survey. You know, what are, they, what are they interested in? What do they like? What do they do? All the students in your school are unique individuals. So we're going to use that fact to build a diverse and inclusive school culture. All by getting to know each other. Take the time to learn about your students. Who are they? Where are they from? You know, what kind of socioeconomic situation they live in? You know, are they meeting academic and achievement standards? Or are they struggling? Do they get along with their peers? Find out all of that. You need to get to know those kids. Guess what, uh, teachers? I don't care if you don't like that little boy, that little girl. Or if they don't like you. While they're in that classroom, you are their parent. They belong to you in that classroom. You are responsible for them. You are responsible for their economic, I'm sorry, their educational growth. That's your job. With everything that you have to keep track of and work on, it might be difficult to find 
time to init- intentionally just sit down and have a one-on-one relationship with students, especially if you are new to the school or to a leadership position. Now, here are some ways to start. I want you to try to schedule time out of your day to visit the classroom or walk through the halls. Y- you'll be amazed what you find if you go and see how another teacher teaches or how another t- student reacts or interacts in a classroom with another teacher different than you. Or when you walk through the halls and meet different kids. I have kids I don't even have in my classroom that I know because I actually walk down the hallway and talk to them. Let students know that they can approach you with problems or just say hello, and then follow through on what they come to uh, you with as far as issues. Also, you know, just a simple hi or a, how are you doing or do you need help getting somewhere, that helps out a lot. Or just walk down the hallway and randomly high-five a kid or fist bump a kid. That helps out a lot. Communicate your vision and goals for the school to your teachers. Now, this may be risky where you are, you know, depending on where you work. Now, some teachers are setting their ways. Some are just, you know, they don't, they don't care what you do. It doesn't matter. But if you're able to have that conversation, encourage other teachers to come to you with questions and concerns. And here's a key word. Work with them to promote diversity in the classroom. Now, I'm right next door to someone that promotes diversity. You know, we always sit and we talk about things. She knocks on the door, <clears throat> and we discuss how we can make things better in the school. Also, show school spirit. We have, like, spirit days in our school building. Every Wednesday and every, uh, what, Friday? Excuse me. <clears throat> Participate in school events. You know, wear school paraphernalia. Like right now, I'm wearing a Ray Tom Middle School shirt. Up under this, I'm wearing my um, ELA T-shirt. So uh, I'm, I'm showing school spirit. Also, teachers, go to school events. Go see those kids in those football games and basketball games and wrestling meets. Also, um, uh, go to uh, plays and, and, and activities. Go check out that kid at that debate. Because sometimes you might be the only parent representation that's able to come. I'm not saying that the kid's parents won't show up. They may not be able to because of work. Or other issues. So them seeing you there, it may be a strong benefit for them to be to, to actually continue to push because you're there with them. Um, if students see that you're invested in school culture, then they're more than likely be invested to participate with you as well. When you know your students and understand their strengths and weaknesses, I shouldn't say weaknesses, let's say needs, strengths and needs, because your kids are not weak. Their needs you're better equipped to secure a strong learning environment where they can all uh, thrive. Okay, I got about 10 more minutes. Part of supporting diversity in the classroom is creating a safe space for students and educators to talk. What I'm saying is the more it's visible, the more it's seen, the more it's discussed, the more it's integrated. When certain things happen, teachers and school personnel will be more amped to fix it. So, as a school leader, this goes to principals. As a school leader, you're in a position to lead the conversation and inspire others in school to take action. Note, the key word is school leader. School leaders are more than just someone that sits in in an office with the door shut. School leaders need to be out there walking amongst those hallways, meeting students, knowing students, meeting teachers, knowing teachers, supporting teachers, supporting students, supporting parents, knowing parents. you got to be visible. Just as a locker is visible in the hallway, your school leaders need to be visible, that same visibility. You know, sit down at the cafeteria and have lunch with your teachers, with your students. You know, sit amongst the students, sit amongst the staff. Don't talk at them, talk with them. And that's more powerful. A good school leader serves their school building. They don't act as if they're a pagan god seeking worship from their students and from their staff. It don't work like that. Good school leaders need to be able to address concerns and needs and work with 
students, teachers, and parents, and communities, individuals, to make those students more successful. The, this conversation shouldn't be just limited to words. It needs to be action to take those steps. Build up those building blocks to make your school building more successful diversely for your students. Use language that promotes positivity and it does not reinforce existing stereotypes. For example, there are some phrases that should not justify sexism and racism and aggression. All right. Someone made a comment to me in regards to. Um, how can I say this? Um, the conversation was willful ignorance. Willful ignorance should not be in a school because all willful ignorance is is playing that I don't know card, and really you know. And a lot of students are in situations where teachers would say something, and that teacher would say, well, I didn't know that was an issue. Okay, that you work in a scholarly environment. You mean to tell me saying that, you didn't know that saying that will make that person upset or feel uncomfortable? Respond immediately and effectively to inappropriate comments or actions. So when it happens, as fast as that issue happened should be as fast as your response is to fix it. And also, you got to be serious about those actions too. We got to model inclusion and acceptance. We got to encourage students to include all of their peers if you see division forming on racial or economic lines. So basically, if you see division, we got to get together to fix it. Cause think, about a, think about a cut. If, if you get a, a deep gash and, and you got to go and get stitches, the doctor or the nurse, they will use skin from both sides of the wound to close it, not just one side. It takes both sides of the wound to close it. So teachers... Have those students reach across that divisional line and grab arms and close it up. Because the more division you have, the deeper the gash, the worse, the, the longer it is, the, the longer it will take to heal. So we need to think of this as a, a, a healing in diversity. You know, going to that doctor and using both sides of the wound to heal. Write this down. So, when we leave the, uh, the conversation and follow through with action, we signal that discrimination will not be tolerated in our school. Note, discrimination will not be tolerated in our schools. And if discrimination is not tolerated within our schools, we have a stronger connection with families and the community because we show that although we have a lot of differences here in our building and we have a lot of differences in our, um, in our school, that we are still working towards that goal. And that goal is to achieve a strong, uh, I'm sorry, a stronger individual, which is our student, to be more productive and profitable in society and in our world to make the strides and changes that we have yet to make. Because in my classroom, I want my students to be better than me. It, it, when I was their age, I didn't have teachers break down a, a diverse classroom. I had a lot of division in my school. Our students don't deserve that. Our world is not, I'm sorry, I, sh I shouldn't say that. Our world should not be divisive. And Whitney Houston said it best, not to be a cliche, the children are our future. We, they, they need to do better than what we're doing because the way that we've done things may not have been correct in certain matters and fashions. Therefore, our students can make better choices than we can. So, teachers, do your research. Do your research on your students. Do your research on the individuals that you serve. Because when it comes down to it, what we do benefits them. And if it benefits and when, if it benefits them, it makes the world better for us. I'm going to end on that note because that right there is powerful. What we do is not for us, it's for those students. 
And in turn, if we're doing right by them, they will in turn do right by us. I'm Tyrone Gathers Jr., and you are listening to the Source of the Inkwell. In the Inkwell, education is knowledge. And just like knowledge, I'm sorry, just like ink, it tends to overflow. Let it stain and let it be permanent. God bless, and I will see you next week. It's good to be back, y'all. See you later.